mentioned earlier, our last speaker of the afternoon is Peter Cartwright of Cartwright Consulting Company. Peter correctly points out that the world will be trying to deal with a fixed quantity of uh, deteriorating quality water and the challenges ahead of us will be significant and daunting. With this in mind, the demand for safe water reuse technologies will certainly grow in the years ahead. Peter, please tell us about the various sources of water that can be used in reuse applications and the technologies that support them. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, I guess I don't have to speak to this. I've got this thing in my ears. So um, I forgot to mention to the uh, IAPMO people here that uh, when I sent this presentation in, I also sent in a, a paper, which I'm uh, prone to do when I give these lectures. So uh, I guess I'll let them tell us how we how those of you who are here can access this, whether it'll be on the, uh, whether it is on the CD or whether it'll be on the uh, YouTube or what. But at any rate, uh, let me get into this. Uh, and some of this you all know, and that is that uh, the vast majority of the relatively fixed quantity of water on this planet is in the ocean. Um, and uh, the next largest quantity is tied up uh, in ice, either glaciers or permanent snow. Uh, so of all of the water on this planet, we only have about six-tenths of a percent that we consider fresh water, either lakes, rivers, or groundwater. And the issue, as, as those of us in the water business keep telling the public, it isn't an issue of shortage of water. It's a shortage of water of acceptable quality. Uh, and of course, the fact that much of the water uh, in the areas that it is needed is not available just because of uh, the fact they're arid or whatever. But uh, certainly the reason why the quality of the available fresh water is deteriorating is simply because of the increase of population and the fact that, uh, that population is moving into uh, areas of uh, relatively short water supply simply because they're more desirable. Uh, I've got any number of friends and relatives uh, who are what they call snowbirds. They go from Minnesota once the weather turns cold and go down to Arizona or California or Nevada to get away from the cold weather. Uh, and that's also, of course, where we have all the water and they go into these water short areas. So. Uh, and to stay up to speed with the additional population, we need more agricultural activities. We heard today that somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of all of the water usage in this world goes towards agricultural activities. Uh, and of course, industry uses more water. We have now, we are now experiencing higher quality standards. Uh, not only the EPA with the drinking water standards, but uh, on an industrial scale, where they require higher quality of water uh, to produce products. So all of these factors, which are up here on the board and, and in the paper, um, contribute to the fact that, that, that the quality of the available water is diminishing. And the reasons, and we've bannered that about all day long, about uh, water reuse, but certainly uh, from a consumer standpoint, the yuck factor is of significant concern to people. They don't realize that, for example, in the United States, by the time uh, river water reaches the ocean, which is the ultimate outfall, the ocean or the gulf, uh, this water has been through about 20 people. And of course, they all wrinkle their noses and, and, and say, yuck, but uh, it's a reality. Um, on, on the, from the perspective of the people who will influence reuse, a lot of them are not available, a lot of these people are not uh, knowledgeable uh, or they don't understand the, the available technologies that are here to uh, facilitate reuse. And of course, economic factors, which is the bottom line. And I couldn't agree more with what David Freeman said this morning about the fact that 
and, and we've just been talking about it now, the fact that uh, there is a real disconnect between the price to the consumer of, of water and the actual cost of delivering, producing and delivering that water to them. And that has to change. It's going to require some political courage, but I believe it has to. And uh, the, the last factor is, uh, to an extent, commitment. Uh, commitment has to be made to, to reuse water. And part of the driving force would be the increased cost of, of fresh water. Uh, so what's required? Number one, the purveyor of the concept of water reuse number one has to to understand what's in the water that that could affect its reuse depending on the application and of course what that leads right into what quality is required for a particular reuse application and then the the testing and implement implementation of the technologies to affect this change now when we think about water treatment uh, a lot of us forget the fact that what water treatment is, is the removal of contaminants from water. And this is a little chart that I made up some time ago about uh, listing the kinds or classes of contaminants in water. Suspended solids, and, and those are examples, uh, dissolved organics, dissolved ionics or salts in water, microorganisms, and then gases. And uh, this is a li list which is much too small for you to read, but it, it is available um, in the paper and in the PowerPoint. Uh, this is a list of, of the plethora of treatment technologies that are available uh, for water treatment, and it's, it's huge. But again, it goes down to a technology to remove a particular contaminant. There is no single contam uh, there is no single technology uh, that is practical and effective at removing all of these classes of contaminants. That's what makes uh, uh, the the business interesting for someone like me because it requires uh, some knowledge of what technologies are best for uh, uh, most effective for removal of a particular class of contaminants. Now, I want to segue into membrane technologies only because I've been in that business for 36 years, so I'm a little prejudiced. But on the other hand, they are the most versatile. Really, when I first got into the business in 74, um, membrane technologies, of which reverse osmosis is really the only one of any significance, were uh, really had a bad reputation. And uh, this, for a number of reasons, one is there weren't really good membranes available at the time, and the people who were building systems and selling them were um, tending to misapply them, and so it got a bad name. And rather than blaming the, the salesman that sold them the system, the end user would uh, tend to blame the technology. Nowadays, reverse osmosis is de rigueur as far as removal of salts, total dissolved solids, TDS, from a water supply, whether it's boiler feed, cooling tower makeup, whatever, even on the point of use drinking water area. Uh, and these are the reasons why membrane technologies uh, are so effective. Now, let me also say that, that no complete treatment system uh, can utilize just membrane technologies alone. You're going to have to have other technologies probably uh, to affect total treatment, whether it's activated carbon absorption, maybe ion exchange, um, something like that. But certainly the linchpin is still membranes. Uh, 